But, but, but our game plan is tonight is we're going to add, I'm going to introduce our, our, our guests, which are uh, the people that really made, brought, made this program possible and made it happen. And um, after they will have a brief presentation from uh, Jordan Lee, who's going to, was the chief uh, engineer on the powertrain, we'll talk a little bit about the engine. And then we'll introduce the, uh, a couple of the other folks that were involved from the uh, design and styling side of the house. And, uh, get to, and after that, we'll open up the questions for the audience. It's going to be a free-for-all, so you can ask all the questions that you know, or you've never uh, been privileged to uh, learn the answers to in the past. So let me uh, get this show on the road. We're going to talk first a little bit about our new engine. I know it's called an LT2, and I'm not sure how much Corvette history those of you all know, but in 1970, there was an LT2. Uh, you know, remember it, it never made the production, but it was actually designed and released for Corvettes, and it was the most ultimate big block ever conceived. It was a 454, 154 cubic inch version of the ZL1, all aluminum, big block, all 454 cubic inch LADA. It, like I said, you could buy all the parts and make one yourself, but there was a big uh, deep proliferation effort at that time, and they canceled a whole bunch of engines, including the LS7 and the LT2, and we only had one big block that year, the LS5, those of you remember, it was a short production year. But anyway, I think we got a great successor to use that name here. So I'll let Jordan talk about, right. about this uh, new product here. Uh, so I really do appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you today. I can talk about engines forever. If you don't believe me, ask my wife, because I talk about engines even more. Uh, and I do want to thank Jim for uh, inviting me tonight. Uh, both Jim and I, we work all day, we have long days. He asked me if I would come out and do it. And I've, worked, I've known Jim for 25 years, a good friend of mine, and uh, it seemed like a great opportunity. So I hope you love this engine as much as I do. Um, so there it is, it's beautiful for a couple of reasons, and I'll talk about it in a minute, about my good friend Tom Peters. Uh, but this is the mighty small block LT2, and you've probably heard it bends frames and it breaks rear glasses, and Josh can tell you if that's true or not. So I don't know if you heard that rumor, it was maybe about six months ago, that uh, the, the engines were so powerful that they can, they're bending the frames of the Corvette and it's going to be delayed and it breaks the rear glass uh, because of all the power. So I'd like to admit that's true. And Josh will correct me. <laughs> it's probably not true. Uh, it's too hard to hook up that much torque and power without spinning the wheels for that to actually break. It is a beautiful engine, and it's a beautiful engine because of this guy right here, Tom Peters, and this guy right here, Kirk. Um, they invited me and my team to, to the studio when they started evolving the, the CE design. Um, and Tom would say, Jordan, you got to come over, you got to look at the car, and I'm never going to pass up an opportunity to go to the studio. It's kind of hallowed ground, it's secret, uh, kind of top secret. And Tom brought us there over and over again. To Tom, you, you sure you want us to all come there? And I know uh, it's design studio, it's pretty secret stuff. And I may remember, Tom said, Jordan, we're so lonely here. Nobody comes to visit us. Yeah. Bring your whole team. Come as often as you want. So we came a lot. And Tom's very friendly, and we're looking at the engine. You know, Jordan, what if you change the, these fasteners, go with a little black finish, change the, the angle of the cover? So it was Tom's way and Kirk's way of integrating us into their whole design process to make the engine beautiful. And one thing I'll never forget is Tom said, we're going to do this new car. The engine is going to be in the back. It's going to be under sheet glass. It's like a, a setting of a beautiful ring. The engine is the jewel in that setting. We have to make it as beautiful as, as possible. And I, it was a, a great sentiment. It really resonated with my team. Uh, and I think if you look at the car, you look at the engine, and all the detail that goes in the aesthetics, even the dimples on the heat shields and the exhaust manifolds, we agonized. We went crazy. through so many different iterations. We ended up having to bring the supplier in to go to this studio to meet Tom so they could tell him exactly what they wanted. They actually changed the tool. It was very expensive. Uh, thank you, Tom. <laughs> but it, it turned out negative. All right, LT2. Um, next slide. I want to just uh, briefly show the unsung heroes, like these folks here. There's so many people that participate in the design of a new engine. We worked on this new engine for four years. Uh, and that's uh, my team, assistant chiefs and design system engineers. They're phenomenal engineers. They're all passionate enthusiasts about engines and Corvettes and performance cars. And they, they do incredible work. And once you drive the car, you'll see for yourself. All right, a couple of words on the LT2 since Warner mentioned it. We do not pick these RPOs by accident. Uh, we have a deep sense of history with Corvette RPOs. Uh, UCS use LS and LT a lot. Uh, every time we select a new RPO, we 
go on Google, we look at the, the research, Wikipedia has a great uh, section on every RPO for small block, uh, every RPO where they went, whether it was core or performance car. And then we agonize with our, our, uh, our groups in GM who don't really care about RPOs, they just want to give you the next one in line. Uh, and the last one, I can't name the engine yet, we had actually get Mark Royce involved to make sure we could get the RPO we wanted. So there is a sense of heritage, you'll see that repeated, it is on purpose, it is not by accident. All right, new LT2, a lot of new features, uh, architecturally transformed for mid-engine accommodations. Uh, there were a lot of things that had to change in order to put the engine in the middle of the car. Uh, we had to make the engine lower. Uh, a lot of work went up into the oil pan uh, to reduce the height of the oil pan to get the engine farther or closer to the ground. Um, the lubrication system is completely re-engineered. I think if you wanted to point to one single thing that makes this LT2 so much different and more capable than the LT1, it's the loop system. Uh, the loop system is kind of like your circulatory system in your body, your heart, your blood, your arteries. If you have a problem with the loop system, the engine will die, it will fail. And on a performance car with a lateral acceleration, uh, you think about what the, the car goes through with the different turns and the high G levels in a turn, all the oil in the oil pan or the, the sump, uh, dry sump system, it sloshes back and forth, just like the water in your water bottle in your car. If the oil pickup tube gulps one little gulp of air, because you uncover the pickup tube, the engine will be fried. You know, by grab bearings, the engine will seize. So for this particular car, the requirements uh, from Josh and his team were very, very stringent. It had to achieve 1G, one thing is 1.2 Gs in every direction. Uh, not just front and back and right and left, but 45 and every, every angle in between. Uh, so we had to completely re-architect the loop system, and I'll go into some detail in a minute. Uh, never, never want to miss an opportunity for more performance. So we have 30 more horsepower, 35 more horsepower to be exact. Uh, new induction, new exhaust. One of the, the nice benefits of a mid-engine car is the exhaust system shorter. The induction system is shorter. When, it, when it's shorter, there's less restriction. Less restriction, more air, more air, more power. Uh, we also revise the uh, the camshaft a little bit more uh, lift and duration on the exhaust slope. Our combustion system is still the Gen 5. It's in the LT1, LT4, and LT5. And we have a new controller with our next generation electrical architecture, which I'm sure you'll be hearing more about as the car rolls out. All right, the block is new. Uh, it's very similar to the LT1, but one of the things that we did that's very different is we sealed the valley of the engine. So in the past, you would get oil that would drain down from the cylinder heads into the middle of the engine, and it would drain down through the cam, and through the crankshaft, into the oil pan, and the suction tubes would pick it up and throw it into the dry tank. Uh, that would not work for the acceleration levels that we needed to achieve, the lateral acceleration levels. So we re-architected the, the entire loop system, we sealed this valley, and now instead of having one scavenge pump, uh, which is, think of it as the vacuum cleaner that sucks up the oil and throws it into the dry sump tank, we have three. A small one that's in the valley, and two that are in the crankcase. And that made a significant difference in making sure all the oil sucked out of the engine. If there's no oil, uh, getting it in the crankshaft and getting it in the crankshaft has less, less chance of aeration, uh, less chance of windage. Windage is a kind of a fancy way of saying that if the crankshaft is trying to whip through oil, it's like you're pushing your hand through water, it's really difficult. If you want to push your hand through air, it's much easier, the engine makes more power. Uh, so more scavenge pumps evacuates the crankcase. Revised motor mounts, a lot of other accommodations. We changed the, uh, the AFM system to a, a new architecture rather than solenoids in a separate uh, cover plate we call the LOMA, uh, lift oil manifold assembly, the solenoids get mounted directly into the valley. What's the now? Active fuel management, four cylinder mode. Yeah. Crankshaft, uh, a new revised crankshaft. We have a different steel alloy, it's a little higher strength steel alloy. The nose of the crank is longer because the stack of pumps, oil pumps on the front of the crank necessitated a longer, a longer nose. Uh, the damper on the back is kind of unique for the DC <coughs> transmission. Uh, it doesn't have a torque converter and it's not a direct clutch linkage like a manual transmission. It actually has springs and dampers uh, to try and perform a little bit of isolation from the transmission to the engine. Really important, especially when you go from four cylinder to eight cylinder mode in those transitions, you want to minimize any of the disturbances that you feel as a driver. So you want it to be smooth. The other kind of unique thing we did is the hub. Typically these things are very cast iron, very heavy. Uh, they're dampers that uh, uh, dampen out the oscillations of the crankshaft. This one is aluminum. Uh, aluminum is lighter. It makes the engine rev faster, so you get much quicker throttle response. Kitchen. 
All right, intake manifold, another great attribute of a mid-engine car, we got a lot more space. Uh, the engine can actually be made taller now, uh, unlike the front engine C7 where we had to really squish the intake down so you can see over the hood, uh, which compromises the intake, and we compromise the intake, it can affect the airflow. Uh, we had car blanche to make the manifold taller. I think it's about uh, two to three inches taller than the LT1 intake manifold. Uh, it allows to retune the runners and get a little better efficiency, better braking efficiency, and it's more power. Okay. All right, so this slide is very busy, and it, it attempts to show some of the unique features of the loop system. Uh, a variable displacement oil pump, uh, which is pretty much the same pump we had on the LT1. We have two different pressure modes, a low pressure mode for low speed and a high pressure mode for high speed. Uh, at lower, lower pressures, you have less parasitic drag. You know, you don't need a lot of pressure at the, right off the bottom for cruising around at 1800 RPM. Uh, the scavenge pump stack, there's two of them here, and they go right behind uh, the damper on the crankshaft, and then the small scavenge pump, which goes into the valley. And you can kind of see through the circuit, uh, the dry sump tank, which I'll show in a minute, would that fit on the front of the engine. Uh, oil is picked up, goes through the oil gallery, through the oil cooler, uh, much bigger oil cooler, 23 kilowatt, where we had only 18 kilowatts with the other one. Um, I think a lot of you probably heard uh, there was thermal management uh, concerns on some of the earlier cars, the C7, getting enough cooling capacity. Josh and his team worked incredibly hard to make sure we had um, probably excessive cooling. We didn't want to have any cooling issues when it came to coolant or engine or transmission oil. So there's a lot of cooling capacity on this new car. Uh, so that oil cooler uh, oil goes out of the oil cooler up through the engine, feeds the bearings. Uh, scavenge is out of the valley, scavenge is out of the pan, gets thrown back into the dry sump tank. So very complicated, uh, difficult to explain. The next picture I'll show you would be the dry sump tank. We'll make it a little more clear when the oil goes. Um, I think I have a better schematic, but uh, you can see that appendage on, right on the front of the box. It's a big plastic tank. Uh, we went from the um, machine aluminum to dry sump on the C7. Also we use the same one on the C6 to this composite plastic which allowed us to change the geometry internal to the, the actual uh, container. It has oil, oil air separation. We have these little centrifuges inside. As the oil comes in from the scavenge pumps, it spins around, the air falls out. You always want to de your oil, drops to the bottom of the dry sump tank, uh, and this, the pickup tube picks it up from the bottom. Solid, compacted oil, no air in it. Very important. Um, one of the things I think Josh's team, uh, Alex McDonald, if you know Alex McDonald, performance manager and the performance engineers, is they did all of their track development. Uh, they do a lot of track development. MRC at Milford, uh, BIR, Nurburgring, you name it, they're everywhere uh, really flogging the car to get the maximum capability uh, out of the car on the track. In C7, we had a lot of engine failures. Uh, we had loop system issues. The loop system really wasn't up to the challenge as we were developing it. We did develop it to the point where it's very robust. Uh, but on the C8, I think we had one engine problem in all of their car development, which is pretty much unheard of. We've never had such an easy task keeping out of their way as they try to develop the car. As the engine engineers, our job is to make sure the engine is uh, capable enough, reliable enough in development to stay out of their way, because they have a lot of work to do with the car. And if you think about the, the challenges they have, not only for track performance, they also have to contend with the weather and the season. So they have a very narrow window to do a lot of their summer testing. When it gets too cold up here, they have to go to other places. Uh, and it's expensive to ship cars. So we have engine issues that derail them for a few weeks, a few months. It really upsets the program. This loop system performed flawlessly, though. You can see here, as an example, this, what this line shows engine RPM from 1,000 to 6,600, the amount of oil that uh, is not in the tank. And so it would be excess of oil that's in the engine. So the lower the line, the better. You want all the oil in that tank if possible. And you can see the C7, we had up to three quarts of oil that were left up in the engine, and then we had seven quarts in the tank. With the C8, we have roughly one quart of oil that stays in the engine, the rest of it stays in the tank. Why that's a big deal? Because when you stack that tank full of oil, no matter what maneuver you're doing in the car, you're never going to uncover that pickup tube. You want that pickup tube. So it's a big deal. And you can see the box in the bottom. It attempts to show that it, Every direction the car can accelerate or brake, uh, one at 1.2 Gs, uh, there was no issue with the loop system. Right? There's the tank. Um, 
it's, we actually bolt the tank right on the edge. We think we're the only manufacturer that does this. A lot of tanks are remotely mounted, like the C7, and you have to plumb it with hoses. This one is directly mounted right to the engine. It's very short, low restriction, so you don't have hoses to contend with. You don't have to worry about trying to package it in the vehicle and have them go through all the gyrations, building the vehicle with the tank and plugging the oil. It's going to be kind of messy. Right. There's a little pictorial of the, the oil pan, and it kind of shows some of the detail with the, the bigger oil cooler mounted on the bottom. 23 kilowatt, which is a pretty big cooler. And then the ventilation system. Ventilation system is one of those other systems like loop, gets no air time, gets no glory. If it doesn't work, it's a mess. So uh, what the ventilation system's job is, is to let the crankcase gases vent, re-ingest them in the engine to burn them so you don't have emissions, macro emissions. But if you have oil coming in through that vent gas, you burn oil, you kill mosquitoes, your, your engine smokes, and you get a lot of complaining about that. So, I'm sure you guys don't like that. So we go through a tremendous effort to make sure that vent system, uh, under all the different extremes on the track and acceleration, deceleration, separates the air from the oil so you're re-ingesting only air. Uh, you don't burn any oil, you don't have to worry about uh, checking your oil level all the time because you're burning oil and have a oil level deplete. So um, there's a couple of little slides here that Jimmy can flip through them and show us some arrows. Uh, we vent from the tank. Um, keep going. You can see the air comes out of the tank. The scavenger pump throws a lot of oil in here so it pressurizes the tank. The air gets vented back into the valve covers on both sides. Uh, we suck on the engine through the intake manifold, so it's a depression, draws the excess of air through the valve covers into the intake manifold to be readjusted, and we make up fresh air coming from the induction system through that hose to each valve cover to let the, the gas circulate. Really important to circulate it, it's a regulatory emissions requirement. You cannot vent crankcase gases to the outside because it's evaporate hydrocarbon emissions. All right, our fancy exhaust manifolds. Uh, that Tom loves because we did all the things he wanted, even the twisted designs, um, everything for a set. So if you get a chance to look at the car more closely tomorrow, look at the manifolds, look at the shields. Uh, you're probably going to glance over them at first, first glance, but know how much effort went into making them look the way they Even the burnish and the color of the, the shields was scrutinized. You get that burnished, uh, brassy look after you run the car. Um, Catalytic converters, right up at the top, uh, unusually, when we started running these engines and building them in Tonawana, we couldn't let Tonawana know that we're building next generation Corvette engines. The headers came up over the engine, it looked like a boat engine. Uh, so everybody kind of had a, an idea. Uh, it's not a boat engine, but this is different. It's probably not going in a front engine car. So it was probably the worst kept secret, but I think they kept it pretty well. Even though everybody knew that it was a front engine car. All right, just some detail on the, uh, the PGM, which is the, uh, the precious metal in the converters. And then the camshaft. The camshaft, we, we changed the exhaust load and went from a uh, roughly 13 and a half, 13 millimeter lift to 14 on the exhaust and added 18 degrees of duration to the exhaust before to the intake. So uh, obvious question, well, why didn't you do that in the C7? Why did you do it in the LT1? Uh, and the reason why is that there's always a balance on how the engine breathes. Uh, it ingests and uh, exits air through the combustion system and it's a function of the restriction of the inlet and the exhaust. So we optimize the valve timing from the restriction that we have to deal with. And the C7 had a little bit more restriction in the exhaust and a little more restriction in the inlet. So when the restriction numbers went down, uh, we do a lot of um, discussions with the vehicle side of the, the organization to make sure that they're going to hit their targets. We changed the, uh, the camshaft lobes, the duration of the lift, to be a perfect match for that induction system. So, uh, that, those changes uh, help get us more power. Um, if you change your cam on your LT2 or have somebody else put performance cam, there's no guarantees it's actually going to improve the performance. There's very few outside companies, outside aftermarket companies, that have the engineering horsepower that we do internal at GM, analytically as well as our testing, to make sure that the systems are optimized for everything in the vehicle system. So, uh, there's a lot of advertisements, uh, Corvette Magazine has a lot of advertisements that uh, get your induction system and get an extra four power. Um, you can always talk to me, I'll tell you what's real and what's not real. Most of it's not real. Okay. All right, um, torque curves. Here's the LT1 versus the LT2, and you can see the LT2 in blue, very similar to the LT1, so we've got pretty much the same low-end torque, a little bit of dip in the middle, but uh, the extra breathing efficiency 
really helps pull the top end up, which is why we're able to rate it 495 years ago. And then the last slide I had is uh, uh, our plant where we're building the Altitude. We're really proud of this plant. Uh, GM has a lot of history, a lot of history with Corvette since 1953. Small block since 1955. Since 1955, uh, Corvette has had small block powering it every year since. And we continue that tradition. Tonawanda is also a very famous engine plant. Uh, it was uh, built in 1937 uh, by a very famous architect. He's built a lot of uh, plants, industrial buildings, uh, also in the Detroit metro area, Albert Kahn. Uh, the original 1955 small block was built there. It holds the world record for single day engine production of 8,800 engines a day. That's an incredible number when you think about it. Uh, today, that plant is maxed out. There were more plants at that time, and the small block engines that we build there, we build roughly 2,000, 2,200 a day. Uh, and you know, that's pretty much full out. So to get to 8,800, they were pumping them out at a very bad pace. I don't think that, that number will ever be uh, ever be uh, The plant also was converted to make aircraft in World War II. Uh, it's got our newest and greatest flexible machining centers. Uh, most of our engine plants today have CNC equipment, uh, which means that we can control each machine independently. Uh, uh, cutter pads, computer-aided cutter pads, no longer these big transfer lines, which only can mean one thing and are not easily adaptable to new designs. So it's uh, uh, the newest way of making and machining parts. It allows us to machine LT2s, uh, our LED3, LED4, LED6, LED7, all of our truck variants also. There's a lot of flexibility there. So it's very modern, very modern. Uh, on the bottom right here corner, that's going to be the badge that we're going to put on the LT2 engines in time. It's going to be kind of messy. Thanks, Jordan. That was a great one. So everybody can appreciate what 495 net horsepower is. You know, those you know, gray-haired fossils like myself remember back in 67, 8, 9, when you made a 427, 435, we'll try power, that it was just god awesome. Well, the net horsepower out of 425, rating it like we do the current engines, was 335. So this is 50% more powerful than what we used to think was the Fuji Manuli of <laughs> So, yeah, congratulations to you and your team for having done that. By the way, again, I also had a negative sign. I put together my Stove Bolt 53, and uh, I didn't see anything in your presentation I could retrofit onto my car. It'd be a little bit better for performance.